Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. Sorry uh, there's been a bit of a gap with videos again. I've been meaning to do this for quite a while. I want a keyboard that I can use with my A2000 and the A4000 now as well. Now, uh, at the same time as this video, I'll upload the uh, adapter there for converting from this, actually, to an A4000. But the principle is the same, you know, as long as you get the pinouts right, there's only a few connections. You've got like a VCC ground, a, a keyboard clock, and keyboard data. Four, four connections in total so and that stands true of the a600 the a1200 the 500 the 3000 the 2000 the 4000 the cd32 i think all of them i think all of the amigas so you could adapt a keyboard like this from an a500 to any of those other machines but the nice thing is we've got a shell for this i'll show you that in a second but also can you see here i've changed the first key there just to give you uh, an indication but i've got a new cap kit as well and not capacitors, I mean like keycaps, brand new set. I've got some white ones and some black ones. So as you can see, this is the uh, key kit here. Uh, we're just obviously missing that one key I took out. So you get them all stuck onto this uh, plastic thing here. You get a couple of different space bars uh, because I think there are subtle differences, aren't there? I think on the A600, is it smaller? I could be wrong. I think that big one there's for the A500. And with those kits, you get brand new springs, you get a puller as well I've got two because obviously got two of these kits and you get the little plastic hooks there for clipping the various uh, you know the larger keys that have got those little clips that go through a bar I'm not sure whether you get the bars I can't see where there's any of those in there I think you may need to provide the bars yourself and I've got a cable of just about the right length here it's about a meter a meter and a half or something I think uh, and I've just gone with five pin then on both sides it's a pass through and here's the case from Stephen Jones. So this is from the Checkmate range of things. You can see the logo here. So if you've watched uh, some videos out there, like on, uh, I don't know, uh, Retro Man Caves channel, for example, he uh, has done a case build of this. There's loads of people who've done builds, I think, on their channels of these. I've just gone for the keyboard enclosure here, though. Uh, you can see there's uh, room there for the uh, LEDs. Bear in mind, an A500, uh, keyboard in here the LEDs are not going to be doing anything actually with an A2000 so I need to do something with the keyboard to get those uh, to illuminate uh, and maybe do something different with the, the floppy one but as you can see the quality is exceptional there are no scratches or marks the paint job is absolutely perfect it's really professionally made that and, and flipping it over here you can see it's got these little uh, spongy things on the underside there so you don't scratch your desk and uh, if I just lift the lid off, uh, you can see here on the sides we've got these pieces of uh, aluminium, I think, uh, and they'll support the A500 keyboard perfectly there, it should just sit into place. So you've got a gap here, I'm not quite sure why there's a big gap there, to be honest. And a point here for, you know, a panel mount DIN connector. I'm not going to use that, I don't think. Ultimately, I'm just going to just pull a cable straight out the back of it. At some point, what I may do is change my tack to come back to this revisit and get a panel mount 5 pin DIN connector and be able to plug and unplug the keyboard that way. Again, I'm not really sure what this is all about. Why would you need a big gap there? I'm not sure. So this is the keyboard that I'm going to put into that shell. Now this keyboard has had lots of changes and by that I mean like I think the keycaps have been off this from another keyboard. This originally came from my original uh, A500, it was retro bright, and can you see these keys here have gone like super bright, whitish, weird colour, and they're stained in different directions, and you know they just look really weird. Um, it did improve somewhat after it's been in the sun, but still, this keyboard was awful. And as I say, the changes, the original PCB has changed as well. I think at some point this PCB was swapped for another PCB because the MCU on here was playing up, including fixes to the membrane, I think, on this one. So one of the things that's different with the A2000 keyboard interface, the reset signal doesn't go across it. On this connector here, one of the connections on here is the control Amiga Amiga reset. So when you hold those three keys down on the keyboard, it sends a pulse across here. So the, the A500 knows to reset the system. On the A2000, that doesn't work. You've got four connections. You've got VCC, five volts, ground, keyboard data, and keyboard clock, four things. You don't have the reset. I mean, there is a fifth connection. You could modify the keyboard and modify the system to pass the reset across there. 
but I want to try and keep the 2000s I've got stock. Now, one thing I've read, and I think it was Job on uh, EAB pointed out, if you remove Q1 here, he says on some keyboards, it reconfigures it so that the reset is done by doing something to the clock and data lines, just like the original A2000 keyboard does. I'm not sure I understand that because I've looked at the schematics for this and Q1, uh, I forget which chip it is, one of these chips here is a multiple input NOR and it detects the control Amiga Amiga, you've got those three keys held down, changes the state on the output and uh, uses this transistor here to drive the reset signal to the 555. So it's like, you know, if you remove that, you've got no ability to reset the 555 with control Amiga Amiga. Does that make sense? Um, how that would back translate into the MCU being able to configure itself on well it could do it depends what happens on power on if on power on it simulates those three things being held you know press those keys itself in order to reset the 555 and somehow it's able to detect that that process is going on it might work but I'm skeptical but we'll try that anyway we'll try removing Q1 and if none of that, what I've just described there makes sense, I'll show you a printout of in ASCII form of some schematics that someone did on one of the forums. So let's just remove Q1 and we'll see if it's capable of resetting an A2000 when that transistor has been removed. So Q1 is here and the uh, pins are bent right over. I hate it when that is done. It just makes it so much harder to remove something like this. Still a bit of sold on there, I think. If you wobble it while you're eating that one pin, you can uh, free these things up pretty easy. I'm not sure why that's not coming out there. Is it bent still slightly? Well and truly stuck in. So we're all powered up and the keyboard is plugged in. Let's give it a try. I'm skeptical. Oh my god, it works! Yeah, that worked! I'm shocked at that. I'll show you the schematics in a minute. We'll try and work out how that's working because it's a bit of a mystery. The only thing I can think is the MCU is when it's reset doing some sort of check to determine if the reset should be passed via a separate signal on the A500 or whether the MCU should do something with the clock and data signal because that does work. Previously, when that transistor was still in there, you couldn't do a soft reset like that. Yeah, so I'm a bit shocked by that. I'm amazed that works. So I'll clean up the PCB here with cotton buds. And the underside will clean with uh, some of the braid and cotton buds and IPA and stuff. Just clean the three pads up where the transistor came from. The next thing I want to do is get this power LED working here. Now, we've got five volts that's going to be coming into the keyboard, you know, because it's obviously it's not going to have this cable here. This is what I want to get away from. I'll still keep this adapter because it's useful for testing on the 2000s. But ultimately, I'm going to have a proper, you know, DIN connection wired into the new shell. So, the power LED, we can tap from the five volts. We just need to get a resistor of the right size, I think. I think what I might do is just have a look at the schematics actually to see what voltage level, you know, how it's driven, how the power LED is driven. I know there's a transistor on the A500 motherboard normally, but I'd like to try and get the voltage as near as possible and stuff. So let's clean up those uh, pads with a bit of braid. And we'll just clean around there with some uh, IPA and a cotton bud. I also need to clean around the transistor to the right there as well actually, because, uh, yeah, I got the wrong transistor when I first started looking at this. I went to proceed to desolder the one on the uh, right hand side over here. Uh, where's it gone? Uh, there. So yeah, I spotted it before I took it off. It's like, started desoldering it, flipped it over to check and then went, oh, I've got the wrong transistor. So I think I've worked it out. The uh, two connections, the, the, this is the way the ribbon connector goes on the back, you know, the multicoloured connected to the A500 motherboard. The one on the left is the floppy drive LED. The one to its right is the power LED. So we're just gonna solder, put some more solder on there. Relatively large blob. Just tin up the uh, end of this resistor that I've just trimmed down here. Let's just get rid of that solder. And I'm gonna put it in between to over here. This is where the VCC rail is that goes to this 74 
chip here. So let's just solder that on. If we can, I can't wish you don't bridge anything here. Could use a bit of heat shrink. Let's just uh, pull that further up actually. There we go. Uh, and then it's just going to sit like that down there. And we'll just trim the leg back here. Like that. Let's get that bit out of the way. I'll remove it in a sec. Bend the leg down. Yeah, that bit of wire is there. I'll get rid of that in a sec. Just add some fresh solder here. Just tested this, it seems to be okay. So I've gone with a 68 ohm resistor there, uh, and there's a little bit of reason in there. Looking at the uh, schematics VA500, you have the LED signal goes through a 4K7 resistor, and then it goes into the base of a transistor, and the output of that transistor goes through a 68 ohm resistor to this PCB here. So we're replicating this limit of the 68 ohm there. Um, the only thing that's different, instead of driving it with that transistor, we're driving it directly from the 5 volt rail. Now, I tried originally driving it from one of the, the pins on one of these chips. I think I tried the reset pin, for example, because that would be high when it's come out of reset. It's not strong enough. The, the voltage level is a bit low. It's like 4 point something volts. It's a little bit low. So that's when I've just gone across to the VCC pin here. Anyway, I'm going to clean that up with some IPA now, and I'll show you that that does indeed illuminate the power LED. The power LED on this keyboard is not very bright. It never has been. It's one of the earlier keyboards, I think. And you might not think that's uh, relevant, but it is. The LEDs are a bit different between the different boards there. For one thing, they're a different colour. Actually, some of the really old keyboards have got a, a completely different colour power LED. Because the other thing we need to think about is what to do with the uh, floppy LED. Well, we can't connect the floppy stuff up that way to drive it. But I might do something similar what we've done here with the reset. I don't know, so that when you reset it, you, you at least get a pulse or a flash on the, the other LED. Otherwise, that LED is just going to sit there dormant for the rest of its life. And if I switch this on, watch the LED. There you go, you can see it's illuminated. Off, on. It's not very bright, as I say. You can see it more clearly from there, actually. But it's always been like this. If I connect this up to a 500, that's about as bright as it is. And it's the same sort of thing with the floppy LED. Not very bright, the LEDs on this old keyboard. So I'm going to go and have a think, actually, about driving this LED. Use the transistor we removed from here. Another resistor, probably another 68 ohm resistor. Uh, we might need a f something like 4K7 or something on the input, just like the original circuit has for driving this. Uh, and I'm thinking if we can pull the reset signal, what I'd like to do is when you do a reset for that orange, that to go orange, that would be nice. And I'll see if we can draw the circuit here. We've got a resistor there coming into the base of the transistor and the emitter, let me think about this, and the collector here, I've got going up to a resistor there up to VCC and then from here I came out I went to the uh, I forget what the symbol is for a diode now it's, it's like that isn't it and then it's got some little lines or something coming off it like that so ground is down here as normal uh, and then this side here the emitter is just connected to the ground. So we've still got two resistors, it's very similar to the previous circuit there but we're using the original transistor. This one here I have set at 4K7 and this one here 68 ohms. So yeah that is an ohm symbol believe it or not. Um, and that works, I'll show you. So the reason I did this is to invert, to invert the logic effectively because what I was finding is it didn't matter where I hooked it up to the LED was only coming on when you had a reset pulse and that's because the keyboard reset stuff is not working on here at all so I decided what I wanted I'd like the LED off and when you press control Amiga Amiga the LED is on to indicate you're doing a keyboard reset and then it goes off so the signal that goes through the 4k7 into the base of the uh, NPN transistor here I pulled from where it originally was fitted here you know that's the, the third pin uh, well it depends which way around you got it but it's that pin on the right hand side there goes to a solder pad there so it's going via a 4k7 resistor into the base of our NPN transistor and the collector is going via a wire 
to the point it goes to the LED here but the LED is also fed through a 68 ohm resistor so the 68 ohm resistor comes from the VCC connection there over to where you know it's LED, its contact goes it goes to the LED over here so that's what that 68 ohm resistor is, is feeding from 5 volts on its right hand side to the LED on the left which is the point where the wire from the collector of this transistor joins the same point where it goes to the LED and the final point there is to connect the emitter on this side here to ground so I just found uh, some ground rail here the way I did that is obviously you know if you flip the board over and look at where the, the ground rail is on these 7.4 series chips here and then just measure around on connectivity and I found as I say this whole area here is ground that's why we're soldered on there anyway so the only thing I'm going to do now is just get a little bit of captain tape I'm just going to bend this up a little bit get a piece of captain tape just underneath uh, these two pins here, if that makes sense, you just press it down and they can stick that bed down, screw it all back on and I'll go and show it you. Yeah, so a tiny piece of captain tape under there just to isolate those pins. It doesn't look like they are, but they are, you know, so this could be pressed really flat here and uh, these two pins wouldn't make a connection with anything underneath. The ground pin here is not so much of a problem because all underneath it is actually a ground area. So anyway, let's uh, screw that back on. And actually, I think I made a mistake there when I was explaining that. And I could inverse the logic here further, I think. But you can see there, the LED is now on. If I press Control, Amiga, Amiga, and I'm holding it down, it goes off. So that's one use for that LED. But I think the way I explained it a few minutes ago, I was trying to get the opposite of that. That's just now a consequence of where it's... Uh, let me think about this. Yeah, I'd need to invert the logic. I would need... If I wanted to have that how I originally planned, I'd have to add like a, a knot gate or something, I think. Because I can't think of any other way of doing it. Certainly off the controller Amiga Amiga. Because the thing with controller Amiga Amiga is it's only connecting to one place. And as soon as you remove that transistor, all you've got is the inverse, you know, the output here based on the, the three keys you've pressed. So you're stuck with whatever that is. It's quite difficult to know how to get around that without using a knot gate. But anyway, that is better than nothing. Uh, and I think, in some ways, maybe it's better for these both to be lit all the time. Because that green was not very visible, but the yellow is a lot more visible. So, yeah, I think that's okay. So on wobble cam for a minute here, these are the schematics from No Cash on English Amiga board. Uh, you can see it's a uh, ASCII. Uh, schematic is uh, typed the whole thing in ASCII, which is incredible. It must take quite a while to do that. So it's two pages that are joined together here, so there's a bit of a gap there, but you can see, you know, the connections come down here and this connection comes there. Nevertheless, the bit we're interested in, you can see here, left Amiga, control, right Amiga. So those go straight from the keyboard uh, connections into this NOR gate, uh, 74LS27, and its output comes into Q1. This is Q1 here, I think. Uh, does it, yeah, it says there Q1, NPN. Now, the pin out here is wrong. It says it's going into the emitter. Uh, I think actually that's going into the base, and the uh, emitter is connected to ground. So the emitter, some of the pin numbers are wrong there. You know, there's an orientation of emitter base collector incorrect, actually. But the key is the signal, you know, you've got your reset, you've pressed your three keys, comes through this transistor. Uh, ignore these connections here, it's just ground and VCC. And that signal just comes down here into the trigger of the 555. So the controller Amiga Amiga normally, the way this was configured when it had Q1, would be resetting the reset circuitry. So you know the reset on here goes back round to the, the MCU on the keyboard control. So when I thought about this earlier on, I think I kind of over-engineered it a little bit. What I was theorising is because we've now no longer got Q1, what might happen when the MCU starts up, it may stimulate a control Amiga Amiga itself. Now this is just guesswork, because I saw that happening on that A600 we looked at in the past. So I wondered if that's how it behaved. It, it stimulated a control Amiga Amiga itself, but it set a value somewhere in RAM perhaps after it's initialized itself, you know, it starts up, it initializes the RAM, uh, sets a value, a flag in RAM somewhere, stimulates control Amiga, Amiga, which causes a reset, and on reset, one of the first things it does before it sets that flag, it checks that flag, uh, and it's the same with the RAM, before clearing all the RAM, it checks that flag, 
that was what I was thinking, but I think that's over-engineered. I think what's actually probably happening, and I can't be 100% sure, well, I could if I got it onto a logic analyzer and uh, checked the timing of things, but I think what's happening is, control Amiga Amiga, when you press this, you're obviously you know, triggering the reset here, which means the MCU's dead in its tracks very quickly, almost you know, within a, a certain number of microseconds, it's, that's it can't do anything so it can't then do something with the uh, data signal because that's how I think it works on the A2000 it, it modulates or does something it does something to the data signal it, I think it does like a PWM thing stretching a pulse or something to create a reset I could be wrong it's just recollections of something I read years ago um, but because this has been reset yeah, can't do that. It hasn't got time to do it. So I think that maybe they just coded it so that the MCU, when you do control Amiga, Amiga, does whatever it normally does with the data line there, i.e. to support the A2000. And perhaps the A1000, I'm not sure if that works the similar sort of way. But because you've got Q1, that will never happen. So by virtue of removing Q1, you kind of introduce the, the way they originally intended it to work. Does that make sense? I think so. I could be completely wrong. And of course, the puzzling thing with that, on the A500, why would they not just not have Q1 and support it the same way it worked on the 2000? That's the bit I don't get. Maybe it's because there's some additional circuitry on the A500 would be required to decode that signal. That's the only thing I can think. So I think the next thing we'll do here is change all of these keys. Uh, if I just use this keycap puller, you can see it pulls off. I may as well swap the springs as well. Let's put new springs on it. Why not? Well, it's my first time working with these, and uh, I'm not impressed with the quality, actually. You may have seen other videos going, oh, these are great, they're fantastic, they're just, you know, all the other ones fit on, they fitted on okay. I would say they don't snap on like the original ones did. This one here, it came out of the frame. The original frame was on very easily. So straight away I was thinking, oh, I wonder if this one's not going to be as good as the others. And uh, if I just push this on here, it fits on, but just watch, it just pops straight back off. So, yeah, some of these keys are not as good as others. I'm not sure why it's not clipping on there, because if I show you, if I get the original one, let's just get any old key here. Hang on. Yeah, it doesn't really matter that it's not the right key, but if I just uh, put that one on, hang on. Did you hear that snap? It snapped on, there's no way that's coming off. So, maybe that cavity there is a little bit looser than some of the others. Uh, but I did find that when I pushed these ones on, they didn't clip in quite as well as the originals. So, they're fractionally smaller. Just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. That particular key there, I might need to, I don't know, stick a little bit of rubberized glue. You know, the stuff that you can easily peel back off, uh, just to hold it in place. I wouldn't super glue or anything like that. We'll see how I get on with the other ones. That's on the wrong way now. Yeah, we'll see how I get on with the other keys. I'll report back. So another progress update. These keys have all gone on fine. It's just this key here. It just falls off. So, uh, But lots of them are not clipping on very well. So it isn't just like the, the plunger parts here are a bit worn. You know, the receptacle for that little square piece in the middle there. It's a case of these aren't as tight as the originals. So, I mean, a good test would be to do that. If the key flips off when you do that, you've got a problem. And this is exactly what I'm with this one. You just tap it and it goes, bing, flies off like that. So, I'm really not sure what to do with this. These really are sh Just watch this, right? Press it, no problem. Just watch. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. The thing is with this, this keyboard is not worn to the point that the keys are falling off. Uh, I'm just going to go and find that original arrow. Let me just see if I can get out here. Yeah, here we go. I've got the right arrow. Did you hear it clip on? Look. It snaps on. It fairly... It, you know, it snaps really, really well there. snaps on. But this other one... I'm really annoyed, actually. And I'm amazed nobody else has pointed this out. These are shit, Absolutely sh**. Now, the thing that's different about the way I've do I'm doing this, these keys have been sat around in a cold environment ever since I got the uh, 
the keys. So they've never been used, they've never been, uh, I've never turned them off. I think I took one off and tried it on an, uh, an Atari keyboard at one point, but all the other keys, like that, that one's never been on a keyboard before, yet it doesn't even fit. Doesn't even fit. And it's not like I've got the Samsung instead of the Mitsumi. These are Mitsumis. Let me just show you. Uh, can you see? Look up close. Can you see they're both the same? They're both square. So this should work. These are designed for the Mitsumi keyboards. Yeah, I'm going to revert. I'm going to put the original keys back on, I think. The other thing I'd point out is these white bits are tight on the bars as well. Uh, anyway, let's leave that one there. Uh, all these keys have just pulled off really easily without even using the removal tool. But when I put the original ones back on, they fit on really tightly. I am uh, not impressed. Uh, of interest, I'm going to go test these on my 1200 to see if they're any better on the 1200. So I'm putting the old ones back on now. Uh, well, the old ones are terrible, but the old ones look terrible. Watch. Look how that snaps on. There's a huge difference. Those are the keys are absolutely crap. So I can confirm they fit a little bit better on the A1200. You can do that and they don't flip off, but literally you can just pull it straight off with your hands without any tool dead easy to get off and on. But it will just hold in place. I would imagine after a lot of use, or if it gets cold in the environment you are, keys could start popping off even on a 1200. So I don't know. Don't Is it because these have been sat around and not used for a year or more? Has something happened to them? I don't know. Right, so I've asked the question on Twitter and on my Discord there if uh, anybody knows what's going on with those keys. But I tried them on my 1200s, as I said, they're not good. They don't even work very well on the 1200 either. Um, so what I'm going to do is I've ordered a power mount connector for this, but in the meantime, I am just going to solder one side of this directly on. So I've nothing lost doing this. Buying this cable like this for a few pounds has meant that one side of it is already wired and uh, we get a free connector as well uh, and these connectors sell for about a pound each or something it's always nice to have an inline five pin din like this so there you go we're all done so i've got the yellow wire coming to that pad there the red one coming to this here white to there ground is the third one down there you know it's the third one of this strip and that's it, just those four wires. So the next thing we'll do here is uh, just sit this into position. You can see that there's a little catch on the end there, it slides in and is held in place. Uh, now there's no position for screws on here, it just kind of just gets held in by the lid by the looks of things. But there is a position right up here for a screw look. Yeah, so those screws fit nicely in the top there and just hold the thing in. So when I redo the den, I'll be removing this cable as well. There's no point in this cable being on there, is there, the, the original one. So I've just fed my connector out the back there. But bear in mind, I'm going to be redoing this and sticking a, a socket on there. So, And then these plastic screws, I presume, are for holding the uh, case together, actually. So I've got four of those. And if we just get this over there, it overlaps on the that side and on this side. So the first observation there is those LEDs aren't lined up properly. The other thing would be nice is if the LEDs protruded a little bit through here as well. And the keyboard pulling is pulling to the right a little bit. As you can see, I'm just using these uh, plastic screws here. Now, the thing is, you don't want to slip off these. You don't want to tear the head of this up either. It's quite difficult to hold and film this at the same time. Yeah, nice and slow. Yeah, and just a bit of fine adjustment there to get that nice and straight. They're all sort of flat, like that. Now there we have it. All done. So bear in mind, you won't have this thing here. I'll remove that later. And I will have an adapter here, and the cable will plug into there. I'll, I'll desolder the wires, stick a DIN on there, and a socket here. And a finishing touch here, I've got a badge there, so I'll stick that on as well. It's got a 3M thing on the back of it. Uh, but yeah, this is going to be used primarily with my A2000, so I figure why not stick the matching badge on that. So I had a change of mind, I decided I was going to have another go with these keys. Uh, now I found a way of mounting these, they are painful, the quality control is shocking. And I'll give you some close-ups when I'm done, but like, you know, the alignment of the print on the keys, you know, some of them are just slightly off. I can give you a quick example here, I'll try and get this as straight as possible. Uh, hang on. So if you look here, this key here, the arrow, is pointing upwards slightly. And this one here is pointing upwards slightly. So, yeah, they're, they're not great. 
but from a distance it doesn't look too bad. Uh, now the interesting thing is, like I said, some of these keys come off really hard. So what I mean is you use the extraction tool here and you get a really firm snap off so you know it's a really good fit. Uh, and you think, okay, so when I put the new key on it should be good. Uh, and sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. So I'll give you an example, I removed like all of these keys here and every one of them bar one was really stiff to get off. And when I came to fit the replacement keys, but the opposite was true of here, so you know it's like half of them. Half of them were really hard to get out, and half of them just literally fell out when I pushed from the underneath here. And when coming to clip them on, surprisingly, I would say 60% of them went on okay, and not the ones where they were really stiff. It varied a little bit. Some of the ones that were really sloppy, I thought, oh, there's no way the key's going to go into there because this one came off really easy. And it went in really firmly. So there's no consistency at all. It's almost like the, the sizes of the plunge, you know, the little square bits are ever so slightly different. Uh, and obviously, some of these keys here may have been off numerous times, maybe a bit worn. So the combination between the low quality of these, you know, and I'm not saying that lightly, I've got two lots of these. I've got the white one and the black one. They're awful awful I'm not impressed at all now the interesting thing is someone was saying on Twitter that uh, they, they hadn't received these you know that the, the campaign hadn't actually delivered um, and it was put on hold kind of thing which I wasn't aware of because obviously I received this black set and the white one maybe this is why maybe they had some quality control issues and they realized after they got the black and the white sets out that there was some sort of issue I don't know Anyway, so the way I am getting these on is any that uh, are loose, I'm using some PTFE tape. I cut a little bit, I'll show you, and I squeeze it all around the actual peg and then stick it in. And the whole, you know, a number of these have been PTFE'd and it's solid. I'm using a screwdriver here that's just small enough to not damage it in any kind of way. You see that one came out uh, with a bit of resistance and that one did as well. So those, I think, are going to be good. Now I'm going to remove the G and the H from here. Look at that, that's fairly stiff. Not the stiffest of the keys, but uh, that one's a little bit looser. So I would suggest the G is going to be bad, the H is going to be good. So let's just try the H without an PTFE. See, there's no snap. It is holding in place, but barely. Look, I can just pull that off with my fingers, look. And then get a grip on it. It's the sort of thing, if you flicked it like that, they can fling off. Yeah, there you go, just pulled it off. So I'll cut a bit about that one. Yeah, it's like a really thin rubber and it's kind of like, you know, really silky. It's weird to hold. Uh, and what I've been doing is kind of like putting it over the plunger, hold it down, double back it across itself like that, and then squeeze it all around so that it doesn't interfere too much with the spring. Uh, and it kind of just holds itself like that. Let's try that now. Yeah, that's now holding. You could almost like lift the keyboard with that now. Can you see that? Just get a bit. Try and get a better grip on that. You may be able to see. Look, I can almost lift the keyboard. It's not coming off. So that is all that's needed. But it's really annoying. I've been at this for about two hours already. Can't believe it. I'm getting stuck at the last hurdle. Look, the key is just sticking down. I changed to the uh, white bits from the original thing, original key, that didn't make a difference. I might have to try a little bit of lubricant on the various parts there. I don't get it. It's almost like it's marginally out in terms of its alignment with these things here. This is crazy. I've even had a little bit of uh, mullico around there. Just watch with the original, the original key. There's no mounts or anything there, you know, I'm not using the brackets. It works, it goes up and down, and it's a fairly firm fit. And if we put this key on, again, we're not using the mounts and things there. Just get the key, the line on the top, clip it on. It just sits flat, and you've got to pull it back up. I think what's happening here is the plunger on this one is bigger than any of the others. That's the problem. So it's kind of making it expand out so that it can't travel up and down. You know, and I've tried pressing down to make sure it's clipped on it is it's clipped on it's holding on look and you can pull it off so I don't know what to do about that that's a huge problem well I'm getting nowhere with this and I'm faced with having to put all the original keys back on again um, 
spring I may hear you ask I tried changing the spring for one of the new springs in the new kit just the same I know what the issue is you know what I'm amazed nobody's pointed this out all the people that have changed these keycaps how has nobody had this problem apart from me I don't get it I think it's these things here let me just pull these out those are the original ones if you look at how this is manufactured here look at this notch here in respect to these the tops of these here are actually lower down than the top on that. I don't know what you can see, it's just fractional. Like we're talking about half a millimetre or something. You know, the actual part here is just a little bit lower than this level. And on this, they've kind of centralised it. It's like this is in the centre of where this is. So these are in the wrong place. There's no way that's going to work without any issue. That is the problem, I'm sure of it. But now we've removed those things there, let's just see if that makes it any better. Yeah, look, it's a bit better. That's what it is. So these things are catching on the thing on the bottom. That's what the problem is. So I've managed to use the clip there, we can't have the one down here. Because uh, that's the problem, it's a stupid design. And I've got the clips, the black, those white plastic clips here are the ones that came with this set. I tried it with both. I tried a number of things to try and get that bar working, but anyway, you can see that is now working. Probably going to have to put PTFE on it again, I suspect. Is that going to hold on? It's going to come off too easily, so it's going to need some PTFE again. But anyway, it's okay, it's just not got the rigidity it would normally have at the bottom here because of that bar. Oh my god, I am officially getting really cheesed off more than any other video. Seriously, what colour is that space bar? Yeah? This is a grey space bar for a black keyboard. What the f***? I wish I checked this sooner. I'll tell you what, I'm never buying anything from that company ever again. This is just shockingly bad in every way. And I've not got any plungers for here. They, they didn't give me any spare plungers for these. They give me every other plunger possible apart from the ones for the space bar. Well, I have to use the original ones, won't I? Well, I may as well put the white one back on, I don't know. I hope to goodness these fit. It might look a bit different with a grey space bar, I guess. Looks like these go a specific way around, actually. I honestly don't know what to do. I don't know whether to keep going with this or not. It's like with every single key, I'm like, oh, shall I undo this and put the original keys back on, you know? Because you know what? As faded and awful as these keys looked, they actually look better than this does. Because uh, look at this here. If you look at the MIGI key here, this letter actually is misaligned compared to the other one. They look totally different in their alignment. I mean, for the most part, as you go along the keys I've done there, they're not too bad and because of the PTFE on I would say 50% of them they're not going to come off they're okay uh, it's annoying I couldn't have the under bar on that and it's even more annoying that I haven't got a black space bar what I would say is if a1200.net want me to correct this video um, please send me a black space bar and please explain what has gone on with the keys on this and reading their campaign the keyboards I'm using here should work with it okay. Same with my 1200. The same problems I've got with this occur on the 1200. This is why I started using it on, on this because I thought if I can't use it on here, I'm never going to use them. What do I do? Sell them on eBay? A1200 keycap kit from hell. You know, you've been warned it may not work with your system. I don't know. It's, uh, I'm shocked at how bad this is. It's not what I expected at all. If you look at this key here, can you see the bottom of the A? it's pretty straight. Look at that one. Can you see it's kind of sloped up that way? Even the print quality on these is shockingly bad. And there's no rhyme or reason as to whether these keys grip really well or not. Just watch this one. It came off really firmly and it went on really firmly. It didn't make a snap sound or anything like that but that one doesn't need any uh, PTFE. On a few of these keys I've ended up using a piece of insulation tape because it's thicker that key there was super troublesome you just get popping off you know you can do that and it would just flip off even with the ptfe on it 
So, uh, yeah, again, I am not sure why. Why is there so much of a tolerance difference between the keys? Uh, and just to reiterate, the key that was on here, it came off really stiffly. It was really hard to get off. And it's not that it's not pressed down, you know, all the way. It's just not holding in. It's like the, the square plunger on each of these is not the same across all the keys. Anyway, that uh, seems all right now. It's just a It'd be interesting to see what that caps lock looks like there. We're going to be able to see the LED clearly through the little window. Uh, I mean, it's not too bad with this grey space bar, but that's not what I ordered. It's crazy that that's what it came with. So I'm almost there. You can see I mounted the uh, socket here with a couple of screws and nuts. And those are the original screws that came with this, actually. So let's just uh, test my 5-pin DIN will fit that. Just pull that here and off there. Yeah, that's going to go in without an issue. And you can see the wire, it's a little bit short, you know, it's sort of folded under and uh, it's pressing on the edge of the case here. Uh, the gr that's the ground, so it's not a big deal anyway. Uh, strictly speaking, a metal case like this, you should ground it. And the other thing I did is I removed the cable, you know, the cable that goes to the A500. So that's not flapping inside there. I can use that because I've got a keyboard that's lacking one of those, actually. The benefit when I had the cable coming out of here without this plug on it, is you can actually feed the excess cable back inside there. So when it's close up to an A2000, you wouldn't have tons of cable out the back. But again, you could do the exact same thing here. You could plug it in uh, and then just bend it and just tuck the excess cable in here like this. So I'm not sure that's what it was designed for, but uh, yeah, look, it makes quite a nice little tidy hole there. My cables would be really tidy. We've just got this uh, short thing going on here. Something else to point out, before you screw the two screws that hold the keyboard in, if you slide the keyboard all the way to the right, then the LEDs here are in the perfect position. But they are sunk down, you know, they're not raised up here. So the, a few things there. I spoke to somebody else who'd got one of these, and he said that his actually sat raised a little bit which is interesting. That may suggest that the rails on the inside that lift the keyboard up on his are slightly, uh, you know, slightly more inclined, or it could be a variation on the keyboards. You know, the height of the LEDs could vary a little bit. It's an earlier keyboard, this, although it's got uh, the later uh, color LEDs there. I think they were swapped around at some point. So, I mean, the other thing I could do is there's an off leg on the underside of where the LEDs are soldered on to pull it a little bit. So I could raise them up. I might do that later off camera if it's bothering me. But it would just look a little bit better if these were, you know, sticking out just a tiny little bit, almost like level with the uh, gap, whereas at the moment they're kind of sunk down into the gap. So I think I'm happy with the end result. The only thing that's annoying me is this space bar being grey, although it's not that dissimilar, you know, if I tilt the keyboard. Yeah, it stands out more when you look at it face on, but anyway, uh, I think it's turned out okay. And all the keys are, you know, fitting okay, not, not brilliantly, okay. They won't come off if you tap it when it's upside down, for example. Now if we go to key test, so let's just uh, quickly test everything here. Hopefully all of them will fly off when I do this. They shouldn't be. Yeah, we don't have that key there. We don't have the, the one down here because that's a different uh, keyboard. You only get that on 500 plus. But it's looking okay, I think. Sweet. So we've got a shift there. There we go. So that's all keys. Fantastic. So similar to the problem I had with the return key, I did find this enter key was a little bit unresponsive. It was, uh, you know, to press it the right way. If I pull the cap off, you can see I don't need anything to hold that on. It uh, will come off uh, just by, you know, using my fingers. But I've removed the white uh, things there so that it's not using the bar. It's again the same problem that the return key had, that the alignment is subtly different by like half a millimetre, and that's enough. But now, you can see it works every single time. What was happening before, I'd press it and it wouldn't register. I'd have to press it quite hard in a certain spot. Now I can press it anywhere and it always registers. There's the cable that I removed from the keyboard. There's no point leaving that on there because I've modified it so it wouldn't be safe to connect it to an A500 now, I don't think. And as you can see, I've put all the uh, keys, the old ones, onto here. So the interesting thing, can you see we've got lots of black keys left? This could be useful if you've got an A600, uh, because 
I think that these here are for the A600 actually, and it's got a different return key look. Um, what else have you got? You've got the help key here, delete key, uh, escape key. You've got the two shift keys, which I think are short on the A600. But what you could do if you've got one of these kits is, you know, if you've got an A600, you could change the enter key, change the arrow keys, just maybe even the shift keys as well, just to give it a bit of a different feel. I don't know. And of course this uh, key holder here is useful for storing your old key sets in this way. So I'll just keep this for spares now I guess. So I'm sorry it wasn't a super exciting video. We covered a few things in this video I guess that you might be able to use in other places like the, you know, doing the reset mod there you could adapt a keyboard like this to work with a 600 or a 1200 or a 2000 or a 4000. Um, there'll be uh, another video going up at the same time as this, perhaps before this one, you may have already seen it. I'll stick a link up there if it has, for an adapter to connect to an A4000. So I can use this keyboard now with my 2000 boards, my cased 2000 and my 4000 board. So 10 out of 10 for the uh, Checkmate case here, I think this is really good. It's a little bit pricey, you know, I'd have been better off just buying an A2000 keyboard. There's nothing economical about doing this. Uh, and it's the same with the key sets. The two key sets, even though I got them on the kit, you know, the pre-order campaign thing, it was, I don't know, about 30 or 40 pounds a set. So by the time you've added, I don't know, I think it was about 60 or 70 or 80 quid for this uh, shell, I think. It was a lot of money. I've been waiting months for this. Um, when you combine the two together, it's way more than it would be to just buy a keyboard. So, <laughs> yeah, um, but it's really nice. I like the look of it. But would I buy these key sets again? I don't think I would, unless I had some sort of explanation from A1200.net as to what's happened with the quality control issues on this here, uh, and the fact that uh, you know some keys stick really well and other ones don't. But the original keycap set clips on really well, so it's not like it's worn or something, there's just some weird issue going on with the quality, I think, of individual keys. Uh, and as we saw, the alignment is a little bit off. If you look at the caps lock here, the uh, print is just sloped just a tiny, tiny little bit. It's not too bad, actually. It was more noticeable on the uh, Amiga key on the right-hand side. So, yeah, these key sets, and my white one is identical, same problems, although we do have a white space bar with that, thank goodness. Um, I would give it a kind of 6 or 7 out of 10. If you're lucky, you may find all the keycaps clip on and you've got an issue. And if you're also lucky, you may find the print is really clean and tidy and straightly aligned. Mine isn't in a few places. The arrow keys are a bit wonky. As you can see here, this one's pointing upwards and this one's sort of pointing upwards. So, well, at least this kind of matches. It's not quite the same angle as that one, is it? And of course, the other issue, why did I get a grey space bar? Maybe I selected that. I don't remember selecting that in the campaign. So yeah, I'd give it like a 6 or a 7 out of 10 at best, I think. So I do hope you found the video interesting. If you would like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon links down below. I'll catch you in the next video.